Hey, how you doing? It's your boy Brogan Ark back again with another episode of Brogan Ark on Films. And in this one, we're going to be reviewing Ghostbusters Afterlife, which recently came out. This was a movie that's been, was probably what, two years since it was supposed to come out because, you know, the whole pandemic. Um, and this was a highly anticipated movie for me in 2020. By 2021, not so much. Um, but I still wanted to see it because I love. The Ghostbusters, one of my favorite movies, one of my favorite franchises. So I was interested to see what Sony would do with another attempt at doing a sequel to the first two movies. Because we all know the 2016 movie happened, and that was a whole crazy uh, debacle. Um, yeah, and in anticipation for this movie, I made sure I went back. I watched um, the first Ghostbusters, watched Ghostbusters 2. And earlier in the year, I watched the, finally saw the 2016 movie. Um, yeah, that wasn't good. I didn't, I didn't care for that one. So this was another attempt to recreate uh, a sequel for this great franchise. And I think they did an okay job. I don't think they did a great, phenomenal job with this movie. And I don't think they did a horrible job either. I think they, they it strayed right mainly in the middle, mostly on the good side. But nothing, I wouldn't say anything mind-blowing. Um, they definitely went in the direction that I did not want, but the execution was good enough. Um, but we're going to go non-spoilers. Uh, I'll get into spoilers a little bit later. If you want to jump to spoilers, that'll be in the time description. Uh, so this movie, this time, was directed by Jason Reitman who is the son of Ivan Reitman, the guy who created or who directed the first Ghostbusters movie. So that was interesting that they went that route. Um, Jason Reitman, he's a solid director. I haven't seen a lot of his films. I, I think he did Up in the Air. That might be the only one of his movies I've seen with George Clooney. And um, I forget who, who else was in it. But anyway, that wasn't a bad movie. But he, he has a certain style. Uh, he's more, definitely more of like the human story and people interacting. He can do comedy, but that's, I, I don't, wouldn't say he's like his biggest strong suit. And that's the thing with this movie, um, which could be for, it's kind of a negative in my opinion. Um, and it might be for some people, it might not be. But um, when I think of Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters is a comedy. Granted, it's a sci-fi adventure film, but it's also a comedy. That's one of the things that made the movie so interesting and so unique that it's had that, that, that uh, off the cuff humor, but also like established humor. It was just like the, the chemistry of that cast is unmatched, and it's been they can't recreate it. They've they've tried, and this is another attempt of them trying to recreate it, and they didn't quite get there. And like the humor in this movie is very m m not run of the mill, but it's nothing spectacular, which is also surprising, being that Paul Rudd is in this film. But Paul Rudd can only do but so much, you know. He's not he's not Bill Murray, especially not Bill Murray in the eighties. So he can only do with so much. But the synopsis of this film, unlike which, unlike the Paul, the 2016 one, this one is set in the universe of the first two films. Or another negative I'll get into is it's set in the universe of the first film. Let's say that. And it's, what, 35 or so years later since then. And we find out that we, we meet this family. Um, it's this lady who happens to be the daughter of Egon. Uh, she hasn't seen him and never seen him in his life, but he's recently passed and he's left her this house in this uh, small town in Oklahoma. So she takes her, her and her kids there and they discover that he was a Ghostbuster and there's some weird shit, some weird Ghostbustery shit going on. And the daughter and the grandkids uh, basically kind of reform a version of the Ghostbusters to save the day. That's essentially the synopsis of the movie. So, this film definitely strong, uh, draws a strong comparison, I know a lot of people have said this already, to uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, by that being, it's, hey, remember this classic movie? Let's kind of redo it, but update it slightly with new characters, but still hit some of those same beats, have some of the same uh, enemies or whatever, and make a lot of nostalgia and, and memories and playbacks to the original film. And this movie does that. I don't think it does it quite as bad as what Force Awakens did because there was so much nostalgia you can pull from Star Wars, but it definitely does that. Some of it works. 
some of it was okay. Um, I didn't need that much nostalgia in the film. Like, personally, um, I had a whole video a couple of years ago when they had first announced that they were going to redo, they are going to do another Ghostbusters 3, which, in my opinion, Ghostbusters 3 is the video game, and this is technically Ghostbusters 4, but that's neither here nor there. Um, I had a whole video where I had a plot line of what I would have did with the with the franchise. I definitely kept it more adults as opposed to this, where they're going more kid. I did not want kid Ghostbusters, but this is like I said, that was the thing I didn't care for, didn't want, but we got it. The kids were fine in this film. Let's, so the, the cast we got uh, Carrie Coon as the mom. I've seen her in certain things. Uh, she was fine in this. I like that she was a more realistic mom. You know, she's a divorcee. She's wearing these. She's She's taking care of these kids, but she's also really struggling. She's broke as shit. That's one of the reasons why she was willing to go get this house, because she thought there would be some money in it. Um, and she's a, she's a fuck up, and I kind of like that they kind of gave that a, a certain realism. Um, uh, we got uh, Paul Rudd as Gary Gooberson, who's this uh, teacher who's also, he, he works at the, at the school that the kids are starting to go to, and he's, uh, it's like the summertime, and he's like a, he's like a fill-in summer school teacher but he's also like a seismologist which comes into play with this weird like earthquakes that's been happening in the small town he was good it, you know he was doing his paul rudd thing um you know he he fills in the humor he's like i said he's not in it as much as i thought he was going to be he's not the main focus and he's he's good he's good in his role um we got uh finn wolfhard as trevor who is the oldest son the older brother of the little girl, and he uh, he basically plays his character, was it Michael from Stranger Things, but he's like less of a leader and more of just a known teenager. And that's essentially all he does. <laughs> he's a goofy teenager who's uh, trying to get with this girl, and he's always on the cell phone, and he sucks at driving, or at least he, he's not good at driving. That's, that's basically his character. Uh, <laughs> that's basically his character. That's, that's all he's got. But the real main character is that of Phoebe, who is played by uh, McKenna Grace, who I'm not familiar with her, but she's um, a young actress who's been um, getting it in in the Hollywood industry. And she's good. I like I do like her in this. Uh, she plays Phoebe. She's basically, what if Egon Spangler was a little girl? That's essentially her character. That's all her character is. Egon Spangler, but a little girl. And she did a good job in that, I will say. Um, some of the stuff was a bit... Un- bit a bit goofy like there's a whole moment where she goes into she finds egon's ghostbusters cave and she sees his pair of glasses and his glasses are literally the same design of glasses that she's wearing as a 12 year old girl i was like all right what that was a bit much but whatever um but she's very much like spangler where she's her she doesn't express her emotions that well and she feels like an outcast and she's trying to find herself and it's basically the story is her really finding her groove, even though she's only 12 years old, but she finally finds a way where she can fit in, which is doing science and ghost ghostbustery shit. Um, even though her character, there was a whole thing with her character where she's 12 and she's like, I don't believe in ghosts. But then, and th- th- once she starts to see that ghosts exist, she's just all on board. Like, I thought there was going to be a little more conflict with that, but whatever. Um, but, but the character Phoebe is a cool, she's a fun character. But if you're liking this video so far, don't forget to hit the like button share this and subscribe to the channel we're still growing we can use your help so thanks for doing that now let's get back into the video um another really fun character in this is that of podcast played by logan kim now the name podcast is uh that sounds like a first draft name that no one on the script ever went back to give him an actual like name because he's a young kid he's he's a new kid that uh phoebe befriends at the school um, and he's like a goofy, quirky character. Um, essentially, if they were older, he would kind of be like the new Ray, uh, Dan Aykroyd's character. But um, he's big into podcasting and conspiracy theories and, and ghosts. Although there's a part of that that doesn't make sense about the character. But anyway, he's he's like the, sort of the comedy relief. And but his name is Podcast. That's like I'm a YouTuber and I was in a movie and my name. And, and the name of my character would be YouTuber. It's like, that's just fucking lazy. But anyway, he was fun. He was fun. Him, uh, Phoebe, and uh, Paul Rudd's character were like the two, the three best characters in the movie. They really kept things going. 
Um, there's also the character of Lucky, who's played by Celeste O'Connor, young actress. I'm not familiar with her. She's another girl in the town that Trevor uh, has a crush on, and she's his love interest. And that's mainly it. That's that's really it with her. She was fine though, but there was nothing other than her being the love interest and her kind of playfully with him. Although they don't, one thing they didn't do that I kind of respected was they didn't go full on with the oh we just met each other so now we're destined to be in love with each other. They didn't go that far. Uh, that's there's a whole moment where he even he was like oh I thought I would have lost you. She's like yeah dude that's that's cool. Like they kind of played it more like they're on a friendship level, um, which. I guess was fine. Um, and then the other things, you know, we got recurring people in the movie. I don't know if I should say that's a spoiler, but certain people you were expecting to be in this movie are in this movie. I'll just say that. Um, and that's basically the cast right there. Um, and the bad guy, once again, the bad guy is, who was the bad guy in the first movie? Hey, they're back for this one, which I was a little annoyed with because it's like, all right, we've done this before. Kind of like with, with Force Awakens. It's like, okay, we got a bigger Death Star. Yay. But I will say, one of my favorite things about this movie was them taking those classic designs from the first movie and bringing them back and updating them. But they look amazing. Like, they didn't bring them back and they look like shit. They look great. The Terra Dogs look amazing. Uh, Zul's new design looks um she looks fucking awesome I was so when she was in the movie she was in the movie a lot more than she was in the first movie um yeah she was awesome I don't know who played her there's a whole thing about who played her I didn't look into it but um she was awesome Terry Dogs were cool um the ghost designs were much better in this than they were in the 2016 one I didn't like the designs of the ghosts these looked a little closer to like the ones from the original movies and the cartoons. I don't know if they used the same um, art design guy or they just mimicked his style, but they looked a little wacky for the few ghosts that we did see. The special effects on the proton pack was cool, and there's like this whole thing with the Ecto One, like seeing the inside of the Ecto One and the various functions in it. I like that stuff because I like Ghostbusters, so that was fun. Um, and the mechanics of how Ghostbusters worked actually worked in this movie as opposed to the 2016 one where they had a lot of new tech, but the functionality of the tech did not match what was established in the first two films. I'll get into that. Spoilers, maybe. But yeah, um, the soundtrack, they literally just took the soundtrack from the first movie and overplayed it, I think. They overplayed it. Like, the amount of time that the, the, like the, the sort of wacky music from the first movie, the Dun, 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 dun. Like the, the the amount of time that that movie, that song played in this movie, I thought was a joke at a certain point because it was like, all right, we get it, it's Ghostbusters, but goddamn, they played that song more than they played the fucking Ghostbusters thing, which I think is a crime. They didn't play that to like the the end of the movie, which was weird, but um, but whatever. Um, what's some other things? Um, but those like that's really the main things. The story is fine. There's a bit in the third act. I must admit, there's a bit in the third act that they did a good job with it. They It did bring some tears to my eye. I'm not going to lie. Like, they got me with that one. And if you're a hardcore Ghostbusters fan, I think it's going to get you to some people might roll their eyes at it. I thought they did a good job with it. It was, it was more than what they did in the 2016 one. But I think it was still respectful. And I and I and I appreciated it, and it didn't go overboard. I think if they would have did something with a certain thing, I think they might have been pushing it. But I thought they did a very good job with it. I, I thought it was very respectful and um, a bit heartwarming as well. But um, I wanted, you know, Ivan. Like I said, this is this movie does lack on the comedy because I think of Ghostbusters as a comedy and an adventure. The adventure was good in this, although it took a while. It kind of like Ghostbusters two. Ghostbusters 2, the first 30 minutes is kind of meh, but once they get their proton packs, it, it gets better. This one takes at least a good, I don't know, it felt like 35, maybe 40 minutes. I'm not sure, but it takes a while for the unveiling of, you know, what Egon was doing, or at least the unveiling of what is a Ghostbuster. Like, it takes forever for them to get to that, and it was like, all right, can we get to it? And then once they started to get more into it, I started to get more into the movie, and then, like like I said, that whole last third act where they came up with the plan was cool. Um, but it's not the greatest movie ever. I would still pet this as the third best Ghostbusters movie. One, two, 
Afterlife and then um, uh, 2016's movie. But it's, you know, if you like 2016 more, fine. I, I don't get how you could like that more than this, but whatever. Um, but it's a fine film. Um, if I were to give it a grade for Ghostbusters Afterlife, I would give it a grade of a B minus or a 7 out of 10. It's, an, it's a solid, okay film. I would have liked it to be more than what it was, but for what I got, I was satisfied enough by the end of it. Um, is it gonna, like I said, something I need to immediately rewatch? I would probably skip certain things and just get to the Ghostbustery shit, but that's just me. But it's an it's an all right film. I think it's definitely worth checking out in theaters or, I guess, whenever it's streaming on something or when it's available to, to rent or whatever. But yeah, if you're, like I said, if you're a Ghostbusters fan, definitely check it out. Um, because there's a lot of people trying to hate on it worse than I think they should be, but it, whatever. Like I said, go watch for yourself, make up your own your own opinion. But um, that's all I got to say for non spoilers. So uh, stick around for spoilers. All right, so let's get into some of the spoilers. Now, I will admit I missed probably like the first three or so minutes. So if they if they did explain it, I missed it. But we don't know who the fuck um, Callie's mom is. The mom, like we don't who who did Spangler knock up, or was or was her mom like was it like a sperm donation thing, or did he knock someone up? We don't know because I thought they were gonna go and make it like her mom was Janine, which they didn't do, which I respected that they didn't make Janine the mom, because um, the cartoon is different from the movie and the cartoon. Spangler and Janine were a thing in the movies they weren't a thing they were a thing in the first movie but by the second movie they had changed it to her and Lewis so I was fine with that so yeah who was the who was her mom we didn't really get into that but Spangler had a daughter and she was upset with him and because she never met him and now she's got his house and he didn't leave her anything so yeah the, the mom was the mom was kind of dusty I go like the mom was raggedy um the whole I thought it was kind of funny that Paul Rudd's character, this is just a personal thing, but I thought it was funny that Paul Rudd's character was so interested in hooking up with her. Like, I don't know why he was like, yeah, this lady with no money <laughs> who could barely pay her rent and these two kids, yeah, I definitely got to get some of that. I don't know why he was that into her, but okay. Um, but like I said, their, their back and forth was funny. Um, the moment when podcast took uh, Phoebe to the Shan the Shandor mines and showed him showed her this like new, these carbon that popped up and it had the terror dogs and like a design of Zool. As I, as soon as I saw the terror dogs again, it clicked in my head. I'm like, oh, the mom and Paul Rudd are going to be the gatekeeper and the keymaster, and that's exactly what happened. Who, who could have seen that happen? But um, that was that was funny. Um, that whole moment where Paul Paul Rudd's character was in the Walmart. Which was weird that no one was there, but I guess it was like a super late. That was a, that was a bit odd. I'm not gonna lie, because I was like, why is he in this Walmart and nobody is here? And I guess it was, it was really late. But it's like, if you ever been to a Walmart when it's really late, there's still a good amount of people in there. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> he got chased by the terror dog, which is very reminiscent of uh, Rick Moranis when he got chased um, in the little small state of Marshmallow Men. That was fine. That was that was that was that was that was goofy enough. Um, the terror dogs looked amazing. God, they looked so good. I was a, I was so surprised. I think they used a, a blend of practical and CGI. I'm not 100 percent sure, but the way they were looking, I think they did use a good blend of practical and CGI. That's reminiscent to the first movie where they were all practical except for like when they were like like claymation or something. They were like stop motion at certain moments. But um, yeah, really good on the on the terror dogs. The um, now there's some certain things like I was saying with like podcast his character he's like this conspiracy theorist and this like you know he's all into this weird conspiracy shit but then he doesn't know the ghostbusters that was weird like even when paul Rudd, even paul rudd's character called that out he was like right, i'm surprised you don't know anything about this i'm like yeah how are you like this big conspiracy guy you believe in ghosts but you don't know about the ghostbusters i don't give a fuck how old he is like at least with with phoebe she's like that was like 30 years before I was, she was like, that was like 20 years before I was born, like, yeah, okay, that makes sense, but you, sir, you should know this shit, but, um, anyway, and, and I thought it was weird that this movie, it, 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 it makes sure that you know about Ghostbusters 1, 
they don't mention anything about Ghostbusters 2, which I thought was some bullshit. But they're like, yeah, you remember back in 84, these guys, they saved this, uh, they, they blew up the roof of this building, and apparently there was like a bunch of ghosts. I was like, yeah, I do remember that. But you're, gonna tell, you're not going to tell me people don't remember the fucking Statue of Liberty walking down in Manhattan. Like, y'all not going to tell me that didn't happen, too. But apparently that didn't happen, so I, I don't fucking know. I just thought that was weird. They just was like, yeah, they blew up the roof, and it got weird after that. And then nothing else really happened with the Ghostbusters after that. I'm like, two. Like, Ghostbusters 2. There was a fucking the Statue of Liberty walk down Manhattan. But anyway, um... So yeah, that was weird. Um, the, like the effects on the gear look good. Uh, what else did I like? Uh, Phoebe, the whole bit with Phoebe and, and Egon, Ghost Egon, kind of talking to her and playing the chess with her. I like that. That was good. I, I didn't hate any of that. Um, and him like helping her rebuild the, um, the proton pack. That was cool. I like. I, I kind of wish. I think I would have liked this movie even more if these kids were, instead of middle schoolers, they were, like, high school going into college age. I probably would have liked that a little bit more. I did not want children as the new Ghostbusters, Kitty Ghostbusters, Junior Ghost. I didn't want any of that shit. And as soon as I saw they were going in that direction, I was like, ugh. But, like I said, the movie, they did an okay job with it. It could have been a lot worse, but... It's not the way I would have went. Like I said, I had did a whole video where I gave my idea of what I would have done with the Ghostbusters. I, I, that might be biased, but I thought it would have been a little better, better of an idea as a way to pull, you know, push the generation along. Um, and even the way this movie ends, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be mainly on the kids the way it ended. But I, I'll get more into that a little bit later. But um, so yeah, Zool's back. Evil Shandor, we actually see him this time. Um, he was a cameo from J.K. Simmons, which was kind of which was fun. And Zool just rips him in the fucking half. That was interesting. Um, yeah, well, what else that was kind of fun that happened? Um, the whole scene with them uh, tra- chasing what was he called? The Muncher, which is basically Slimer, but he only eats metal. Okay, um, that whole bit where they're in the you know ch- at the at the factory and then. They run into um, Trevor, and Trevor's driving, and then they're all in the car. Like all that stuff with them in the car with the the uh, trap on the remote control thing. Like that shit was great. Like when you can get into Ghostbusters and you show off the tech and the gadgetry, I love that stuff. And that was fun. Her in the little uh, gunner gunner seat and all of that. I, that that stuff was great. Um, Bokeem Woodbine plays the sheriff. He's barely in this movie. I thought he was gonna be in this a little bit more, but he's Lucky's dad. Um, he was fine. He had that line that was a bit... That was, that was a couple of lines that were a little cringe, or at least a little like, ooh, you're trying a little too hard there, which was the one where they needed the... Um, she was like, you get a phone call. And he said, okay, yeah, you get a phone call. But who you gonna call? And I was like, Ugh. Like, some people... Like, it wasn't that many people in the theater when I saw it. And some people laughed. I was quiet. I was like, mm, no. But the moment where she calls um, Ray... That was great. That was one of the best scenes in the movie where she calls Ray and Ray is like explaining what happened basically where she was like, yeah, we, and even he doesn't talk about Ghostbusters too. He's just like, yeah, we saved the day in, in 84 and then things kind of died down and then, you know, we couldn't, we didn't get as many jobs and then eventually we all kind of split off. Uh, Bankman went back to school. He became, well, he went back to teaching, but he's like teaching like marketing and, and media and all of that, which I thought was a good idea. That's exactly what he should be teaching. Um, uh, uh, Winston got big in the stock market and, and financing and now he's like rich as fuck and fucking uh, Spangler left. Because he was like, yeah, he was like, he's like Egon Spangler. He's like, yeah, Egon Spangler can, can burn in hell or something like that. And then she's like, yeah, he's dead. Like that was that was a good moment. But he explains that Spangler just one day just left the group or he left, well, the group had kind of already split up by then, but he had left Ray, took, like, a lot, all the tech, the car, and all of that, and just, just went and then moved to Oklahoma, and he called him, like, 10 years after that and told him, basically, he was preparing to try to save the world from the end of the world. Now, that was weird that he broke away from the team. Like, the whole idea of him getting jaded and then, like, okay, you know, the whole ghost problem is not that big of a deal. That's something else that's even bigger. I get that. But I don't get why Egon would just completely cut Ray off. 
Like, if the others had already left, I thought it was weird that Egon would just be like, you know what, fuck this. I don't need these guys. I'm going to do it myself. That was a bit weird, but Egon is an asshole, so it's, it's believable. But um, that, that whole moment was great. And um, so what happens after that? So, yeah, they, they do more investigate. It becomes Scooby-Doo after a point. Um, and not in a necessarily a bad way or not even in a good way either. It's just Scooby-Doo. They're, you know, the young kids investigating the shit. Um, and that's when Zool comes in. And I love the whole idea. With, with the whole thing when they realize that the farm is this big trap for them to capture uh, Zool whenever she gets when she eventually breaks free because there's like all these different times throughout time where these big events happen and that's usually I guess connected to Zool so or her attempts of coming back at least and um, they had to stop this one because this was going to be a big one um, in 2021 which I'm pretty sure they had to edit that to 2021 from 2020 but whatever because uh, <laughs> I don't think any of them actually said 2021 Unless it was ADR and someone off screen had said it. But anyway, I, I don't remember. But anyway, so, like I said, Zool pops up. Zool looked awesome. She looked great. I love this, that, the cool design. And it's like, instead of it like that weird sort of bubbles that it kind of looked like in the original movie, it was like these sort of almost like crystal, sort of hard shell texture over her body. It looked great. The makeup looked great. The hair looked great. She was whooping ass. She was awesome. I love Zool. Um, I thought they were gonna full on have her transform into something else, but they didn't do that like they did in the first movie. Um, the whole bit where they they did the plan where they trapped one of the terror dogs and pulled it away from the mom. Um, I like that, and they had to pull uh, trick her to come back to the farm and, and on the premises and all of that. That was cool. Um, the concept behind it was cool. The plan was good. It just it didn't work, and then of course. And the final hour when they thought they were going to lose because they released the, the terror dog and it takes over. It didn't take over the mom again. It took over the girl. Uh, what's her name? Lucky. Which I I guess. I guess the terror dogs can choose who they I, I don't really remember if it's a specific people they have to be attached to or it's whoever. But it, I guess it's whoever it, it deems worthy. So it took her and became the other terror dog because Zul needs the two terror dogs in order to exist on the on our plane or whatever. So they were about to attack again, and then someone pulls up. You know who pulls up. It's the boys. Uh, Winston, Ray, and Peter all pull up, and they got their proton packs, and they really be kicked some ass. It was a nice moment seeing them and them coming in and doing their thing old school, but it didn't quite work, and then they had they needed help, and they had uh, Finn was going to use, not Finn, what's his name? Fucking Trevor was going to use his, but the fucking marshmallow guys came back, and podcast is in the back of the car zapping the shit out of the the, mus the uh, marshmallow guys um, they tried to pull the trap uh, what what happened oh yeah, yeah that's right Phoebe gets the pack that um, that that uh, what's her name Lucky had before she got turned into one of the terror dogs so she's fighting back at Zool then the old OGs they come in and they're they're doing their thing cause they they tried to cross the streams but Zool's powerful enough to uncross the streams and then threw them down. Then that's when Phoebe comes at her. Then the others come back at it, and they're all, you know, crossing streams on her again, but they can't activate the trap because the trap doesn't have power. So once the brother's proton pack is, it can work, he shoots the silos that was the generators for the power, and then the mom turns on, this, turns on the trap, or she hits the thing to pull the traps, and it pulls in all the ghosts, and the day is saved. Um... Oh, wait, I forgot the touching moment. Duh, the touching moment. So when Phoebe is fighting back, she when, when Phoebe is using the Force, you see, to take on uh, <laughs> to take on Zool, she's got a guiding hand with her. It's the ghost of Obi-Wan. I'm sorry, it's the ghost of uh, Egon. E um, Harold Ramis is there helping her. And I have to admit, when they showed his ghost of, like, Harold Ramis, like, older Harold Ramis, but he's got the the Egon look, it, it brought some, it brought a tear to my eye. I'm not gonna lie, that was great when he was like there helping her and guiding her and in spirit and the moment with all crossing screens and then you know Winston looks and then he's like, "Yo, look at this!" and everybody looks and like, "Oh shit, it's, it's Spangler!" Like, okay, let's do this. Loved it, beautiful moment. Um, he doesn't talk, 
because you know I, I didn't want them to use like oh here's some old dialogue from various movies that Harold Ramis has been in we strategically placed it to make a sentence like I'm glad they didn't go that route he doesn't talk he just stands there he does emotes it looked it looked good they they I think the most a good amount of money went into that and it looked really good I'll give them kudos to that I enjoyed that um and you know they save the day they you know he hugs he he goes to the grandson he talk touches on Phoebe and he hugs the mom and then he pieces out that was that was a good moment I I, I like that moment um and one of the things I will say you can tell Bill Murray was trying to have far more fun the second time around than he did in the 2016 movie where he kind of came off like he because you know he didn't want to be there they they legally had to pull some strings to pull his ass for the set um i think he low-key does regret that he held out for so long and not doing ghostbusters 3 and him and harold ramus had a falling out and I, i think he does feel bad about that and he he felt more with it this time, and he was he 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 fell right back into the Bankman character. Um, he had a couple of one-liners that felt like the characters. Um, it was good to see them all together, and essentially the day is saved. Um, and then it, you know the movie ends where Winston is like, "Oh man, I'm gonna take the car back and fix her up," and it shows the car driving down. Um, I guess the one of the New York bridges, I don't know, George Washington, Brooklyn Bridge, and the siren is blaring, because this is the first time we've seen the siren, actually no, second time, by the end they played the siren, and it's going up the street, and then the Ghostbusters theme plays, and that's the end of the movie, and it's like, oh, okay, um, then you got two end credit scenes, first one, which was a nice little scene, it was like a mid-credit scene, where uh, Bankman is, apparently you find out that Bankman and Dana are still together, which I thought was interesting that they're still together, um, and is a callback to the first movie where he's she's doing the little uh, psychic uh, bullshit test with him. Uh, like, can you can you tell me what's on this card? And she's got the old shock box. Like that was that was a fun little bit. He's like, yeah, what do you do with Dana? There's no reason for her to really be involved in the action. But that was a nice little bit to see him and Dana still together. And then the post credit scene is um, they had like a deleted scene, I believe it was, where uh, from the first movie where Janine is talking to uh, Egon, and she's like, oh, before you, it's before they go up the stairs to, uh, to the top of the building to go deal with uh, uh, Gozer. Um, oh, deal with Zool. I mean, yeah, deal with Gozer, my bad, deal with Gozer. I kept saying Zool. Why do I keep, call, I keep calling her Zool? Gozer, God damn it. Gozer is the one that looks awesome. I always get that mixed up. Zool is the fucking uh, gatekeeper Gozer is the main ghost. God damn it. But Gozer was a man. It's whatever it wants to be. Anyway, um, they do have a call back to that line. Anyway, um, we find out when, you know, Winston, Winston is basically going to be the Tony Stark <laughs> or the Bruce Wayne of the new Ghostbusters. He's got money. Um, Janine, the flashback was Janine gave um, Egon this lucky coin and he's like, oh, I don't think I should take it. She's like, oh, don't worry. I got two of them. Um, and it's her in the present with the lucky coin. He's talking to Winston. Winston's like, yeah, you know, I did very well on the financially. And I started from scratch and I got all this money. And now, you know, I want to keep things going. But I, I can also use this money to help in another way. So he's basically going to be the new beneficiary for this, uh, I guess, new Ghostbusters team. He's got, the car, he's got the old car back, which I don't know why he doesn't just build a new one. Instead of just using that old ass. I mean, the car was old in the 80s movie, but whatever. Um, he's bought back the original fire station. So they did mention, I think um, Ray mentioned that the fire station got bought. So he's got it back now. And it seems like they're going to do another movie with a new group. Hopefully this will be more of an adult group. Because I don't see the point of them bringing the kids back. If that's going to move it to New York, I don't know. But um, we'll see. Um, and then they showed that the trap was blinking. There's something in the trap. We don't know what's in the in the, the big facility trap, so we don't know what's still in there. Um, interesting that they didn't knock that fire station down and build it into something else. That that shit is still sitting there, but whatever. Um, so yeah, I don't know what the hell they're gonna do for the next one, but 
hopefully it'll be good or hopefully it'll be better i would say because like i said this is okay film i want something better um but it has its pluses it's got its negatives i think the pluses outweigh the negatives um it's a fine film like i said it's still the third best ghostbusters movie out of the four technically five but um anyway those are my thoughts on ghostbusters afterlife let me know what you thought about the film in the comments and uh don't forget to like this video and subscribe and uh stay tuned for more peace